Well, we are wrapping up our series today about being Mythbusters. Is that okay? But you know, my hope is that uh, there will be something that, that has been translated over the last couple of months that, that is empowering you to be uh, an ongoing Mythbuster, that you are getting better and better at recognizing those things that uh, you would tell yourself that does not match reality in terms of what God says is true. And able to, we've said three things. One, detect it, right? Are you with me? Right? Detect, a myth detector, right? That means you can recognize, oh, wow, that's, well, I can't believe I'm telling myself that. That's, where does that come from? Have you ever had that? Those thoughts kind of come in. And we could say sometimes they come from the pit of hell. Those thoughts do, right? Uh, other times they're just kind of wired into our stinking thinking, right? Um, and so when we begin to kind of detect those things, we're, we're, we start to be really ahead of the game. Myth detection is absolutely critical, and so we're hoping that you are improving your ability to kind of recognize the things you tell yourself that are not based on what God said is true. The second thing is, you come, come now, help me out with this. The second thing is myth confession. Yeah, and you confess, that's agreeing with God. It's where you look at that thing and you say, I've been there, done that, or I'm doing that right now, or I'm guilty of that. I confess that. I, that's owning it because you can't, not everything faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And so confession is a great way to face the facts. It's a great way to deal with something. And then the last one is myth correction. Excellent. There's about 20 of you that are really spot on. <laughs> the rest of you are just chilling. Let somebody else do the work. It's early today. <laughs> <laughs> myth correction. Now that kind of work really requires all, all our senses, all our ability to focus on that thing and say, I got to correct what I'm telling myself. Otherwise, I'm going to be going down the wrong path in the wrong direction, having wrong results. And we don't want to get there. Oftentimes, we don't know that we've been going the wrong way until we're in the middle of something we don't like. And in that place, God wants you to be empowered to say, what do I need to change in my thinking to get back on the road God calls us to? All that is about being a myth buster. Today we're going to look at a myth that's an interesting myth. It's, um, it's one that has um, two kind of ramific ramifications to it. Whoa, wow, here's that. Wow. Um, and it's about believing. Um, and sometimes we've been told kind of at the start of our spiritual journey that all you got to do is believe. All you got to do is believe and, and you'll be saved. In fact, I can give you a verse for that. Okay, so in uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 31, the Apostle Paul and one of his mentees, Silas, are in jail. They've been preaching the good news and they got thrown in jail. And uh, God creates this earthquake thing and the jail doors open. You remember, remember this story? Crazy story. So cool. The move of God is happening and the jailer is just distraught and he's thinking, oh my gosh, they're going to kill themselves. I'm going to kill myself because they're, all, the, all the prisoners have escaped. And that would be like, you know, that'd be the last of his job. He wouldn't just get fired. He'd get killed. So he thinks I'll just kill myself. And Paul says, don't hurt yourself. And so they have this conversation, and he says, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's chapter 16, verse 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Sounds like all he's got to do is believe. Right? right? There's, there's a lot of verses that kind of give us the idea, all I've got to do is believe. And so we'll say, all you've got to do is believe. And that kind of emphasis is that this is kind of a no-brainer. This is an easy squeezy. This is easy believism. And, but the problem is that if it's easy believism, Maybe it's so easy that I don't recognize that there's something that's got to change in me in order for me to believe. And so at the start, if I can, I can kind of get misinterpret what believing is at the start of my faith, I might not be a genuine believer. I might not have real faith. I might have false faith. I might have false faith. If I don't really understand what believe means, and with it, what does believe mean? A mental ascent, right? It's happened. Jesus was, is, he is God. He died for me. I believe that's mental ascent. And if I think that's all it is, then I might not have a genuine faith. I might have a false faith. I might have a real belief. I might have a bogus belief. I might have not experienced real conversion. I may have experienced a counterfeit conversion. And so it was because this is something that the church of Jesus Christ has had to be aware of for the time of its existence that the Apostle Paul wrote, first passage at the top of your notes, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. 
Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Of course, unless you fail the test. <laughs> Pretty interesting passage, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of a, a little bit of an in-your-face passage saying that you may not be a genuine believer. And so examine yourself. Now, I, I'm not sure that this is true of anybody here, but it could be. It could be. You could be the kind of person that is coming to faith, and someone said, oh, all you got to do is believe. And you said, okay, check that mark bo box off. I believe. I must be in. I must be golden. I must be good. And if you are anything like the airman who considers his parachute a nice thing in case of emergency, but hopes he never has to use it. If you consider faith like the airman considers his parachute, you might be a bogus believer. Because God is not a parachute in which you hope you have in case of emergency, but really prefer not to use it. If that's your concept of faith, then you might have a counterfeit conversion. If you have the idea that faith is something about fire insurance, just in case there really is a hell, then you may be a false faith person. And so we're going to look at this. But this is not the only manifestation or ramification of this myth. Because also as we continue in our faith journey, I know I was told, I, I, I came to Jesus and says, you know, what do I do now? I came to Jesus, I believe. And they go, oh, just keep on believing. <laughs> really? Yeah, just keep on believing. I said, that's all there is. Well, you want to get more beliefs, so you want to increase. You want, you want more. Kind of the idea was you need more spiritual belief stuff. <laughs> and if you get more spiritual belief stuff, then you're going to do really good. Just get a lot more belief stuff. And so I thought, okay, well, that, okay, so I just go to church, go to church, go to church, more belief, more belief stuff. Wow, that was an interesting sermon. Wow, that was a great sermon. Wow, that was a good point. Boy, those are cool songs. And you just think more and more. I just need more spiritual belief stuff. Just keep on believing. And that is a myth. You will never hit the goal of your faith by acquiring more spiritual belief stuff. Because it's more than just believing. Let's break this down a little bit more. So in your notes, kind of under that first point, that idea, that confession stuff, that, or that detection stuff, a couple variations of this would be, it's easy to follow Jesus. It's easy to follow Jesus. Um, or faith doesn't require anything. Faith doesn't require anything. It's just this free gift, and it is free gift that doesn't require anything of you. If you're vulnerable looking at, at faith that way, then there could be a problem. The primary issue behind this myth is a disconnect from personal responsibility and a belief that says we can experience salvation and the ongoing effects of salvation through intellectual assent. And I think we try to make coming to Jesus so easy that we fail to reflect on what Jesus really said and really did. I think we try to make it coming, because what? We want everybody to come, and so does God. Second. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 says, It's God's will, it's His desire that none should perish, but that all should come to, and it says an interesting word, repentance. Repentance. Oh, that's interesting. So this is what Jesus said. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14, Jesus says, uh, it says that Jesus came to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. Repent and believe. Okay, so if I just believe, but there is no repentance, then I'm missing a part of the equation. The repentance is a pretty critical piece. In fact, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, it says, from that point, Jesus did nothing but preach the good news about repentance and coming to God. About repentance and coming to God. So that idea of repentance, now that's not necessarily mean that there's emotional you know, a reaction going on in you. The word repentance simply means changing your mind. Changing your mind. And what is so critical is that we change our mind not only about who God is, but who we are. Look what Jesus said in, um, Matthew, or in Mark chapter 8, verse 34 through 36. Um, Jesus called the crowd to him along with the disciples and said, whoever, will want, whoever wants to be my disciple must do what? What does it say? Do what? He must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Now, does that sound like it's just belief? 
There's something there about what we do with us to empower us to know what we do with Him. I've got to first have this sense of awareness, which we've been talking about this whole idea of examine ourselves. And that's kind of what that passage says, right? Examine yourselves to see whether you're really in the faith. Test yourselves. Scott Peck says, human beings are poor self-examiners, subject to superstition, bias, prejudice, and a profound tendency to see what they want to see rather than what is really there. God wants us to really look and say, what's really here? And when you examine yourself, if you're not seeing something of substance about who God is and what you're learning to do with you so you can do the right thing with Him, then maybe there's something missing. And there's a bogus nature to your believing. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to correct that? Excellent. Three of you want to correct it. It's beautiful. <laughs> I hope the rest of you get on board before the service is over. <laughs> So if we did that, I mean, let's, let's look at the confession thing, the confession piece, because here's a couple other things Jesus said that kind of confront this idea of easy believism. Um, Jesus said in his first sermon, Matthew 5, verse 3, he said, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So there is something about the kingdom of heaven, which for those people would have been like, that's got to be amazing, the kingdom of heaven, because they were under the, they were under the, the domain of the kingdom of Rome. And so they wanted the kingdom of heaven. They wanted God on earth. And so Jesus, that can be yours, but you got to be poor in spirit. So what is poor in spirit? It's, it's actual spiritual bankruptcy. Poor in spirit is the idea of knowing my desperate need for God. That without him, there is a debt that I cannot pay. Charles Stanley says, uh, brokenness is the condition whereby our will is brought into full submission to his will. So that when he speaks, we put up no argument, make no rationalization, offer no excuses, and register no blame. But instead, instantly obey the leading of the Holy Spirit as he guides us. The end result is one of blessing. It is for our good both now and forever. That matches with what Jesus said, that blessed, blessed, happy, are those who are broken in spirit. You see, part of what takes place for me to believe that Jesus can fill this container is that I've emptied this container. God will have a hard time filling you with his presence if you're overflowing with you. God will have a hard time filling the container of your being if you're already just overflowing with you, if it's all about you. Last week we looked at this in another light, right? We talked about self-obsession. Right? And self-obsession is when there's lots of you. In fact, you just overflow you. You, 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 you. You, 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 you. Me, 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 me. Right? So it's tough to get more of him if it's already filled with me. And so part of that self-examination is recognizing what part of me needs to go so he can come, so he can fill me with that presence. Uh, Jesus said, come to me, all you are weary and burdened. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you are weary and burdened. And I will give you, what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. Now, now look, at is there something that is, is, just, is it just easy or is there some coming involved? Is there a taking of the yoke? Can you see the, the actions that he says, I want you to do this so you can have this? And so that coming requires a movement, an action, an initiation that takes place inside of me when I truly understand the biblical concept of belief that it's more than mental assent. It's more than recognition of something. It goes much, much more deeply than that. And if I understand that, I can bust this myth and the progressive myth of more spiritual stuff. Information should do it. Okay, so the, the next thing is, is, is our correction piece. Okay, so can we talk about correction a little bit? So here's some ways we can correct it. And I want to, I want to talk about three different, three different things. So um, you might help me with this. Because there's, there's three things. There's, I mean, abbreviate because of space here. There's Christian, the first one is what? Doctrine. The special doctrine. Um, and then there's, what's the second one? Practices. Okay, practices. Christian practices, okay, and that, that's good. So a little help more. There's, there's also Christian virtue, yes, 
Christian virtue. Now, those are three distinct different things, and, but they're all critical things. They're all things that are critical for us to understand. They're all important, and believe it or not, they're all different. They're not the same. They're, they're very unique things, and we need all of them. They're all good. So the first one is Christian doctrine. Christian doctrine is really, really important, and Christian doctrine is about stuff. It's about this. It's about more spiritual information stuff. That's Christian doctrine. It's about what you believe. So there in your notes, it says that Christian doctrine is really about what you believe Okay, which if it's of the heart nature, it has the power to compel you to follow Jesus, whereby we can live for him. The Bible calls that faith. The Bible calls that faith. Okay, so now I want to kind of put it this way. I've got my little guy here. He's got this great little hairdo, little ear here. Um, Isn't he a handsome little critter? Nice guy. Okay, I need a different color here. Okay, so my guy, this is my guy. This is Romans chapter 9, 10. 10 verse 9. Okay, so here he is. Um, and he's got to have different colored arms. Okay, here he is. So here, here's my little guy. He's pretty handsome, isn't he? I mean, I like this guy. You got, can you see him? You can't see him very well, can you? You guys need to see him better. See him? You like him? He's pretty handsome. You know what stands out to me about this fella? His heart. Yeah, this guy's got, you guys saw him? He's got heart, doesn't he? Yeah. So I like him a lot because he's got a big heart. <laughs> yeah. So look at this next verse. So people use this passage, probably more than any passage, to help people start believing. They say, it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our Wait a second. Wait, in your where? And where do you do your believing at? Right? Do you, believe in, do you believe in this? You know, I, I believe my heart pumps. I believe my heart's critical. But I do most of my believing in my head. But that's not what the Bible says. He says that if you believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that we believe and are what? justified, and it is with a mouth that we confess and are saved. So something's different about their understanding, the Hebrew understanding of belief than it is for us. We believe in our heads, but he says, I want you to believe in your heart. Whole difference. We talked last week about something that that I hope sticks with you because we want to tease it out even in the next series. Um, We talked about that all of us have something at our core. We're either driven at a core that's an emotional core that makes decisions and decides on things because of emotional feelings and intensity. Or we are not emotion-centered, we're Christ-centered and I make decisions based on Christ and the truth of who Jesus is. And so which would you say you would, are more prone towards? Anybody ever make a decision out of emotional center? center? Awesome. There's a lot of you that are honest. <laughs> Some of you that are not. And, uh, so, but that's okay. <laughs> that's all right. Because we meet people where they are. Okay? So even if you're not honest, we'll meet you where you are. Yes, we will. <laughs> hoping to lure you this way. Because when you get honest about yourselves, we've all done that. We've all said, you know, we all have decisions that we're supposed to do or things we're supposed to show up to. And we didn't. And they said, why? And we said, I didn't feel like it. <laughs> you ever see that? I didn't feel like it. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So what are we saying? We're saying we make decisions out of an emotional center. And But when I come to Jesus... And I've believed in my heart, God says, all these passages, um, I mean, these are extra credit verses. Uh, in Galatians chapter 4, about verse 6, and in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, it says that we, whenever we receive Christ, we receive him in our head. No, we receive him in our heart. You see, when he occupies that space, he wants to be the new center of your decisions. That's conversion. That's conversion. Conversion isn't something that I've negotiated in my head. Conversion is something that affects the center of my being. And I've got a new power source at the center of I am, and he's driving me to make different decisions. Let me give you a little, a little comparison here, a little, little contrast. Um, in, in the first, we would say this, um, that b- belief or faith that has no action is of the mythical kind. 
Belief that has no action is of the mythical kind. So James, just like Paul wanted to confront this with the Corinthians, James felt a need to address this as well when he said, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your, circle the next word, what is it, actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Isn't it interesting? So we're saying, oh yeah, it's all you got to do is believe, and believe is faith, and, and he says, but if your belief has no action, so no movement to it, is that the kind of belief that can save you? What is he saying? He's saying there's such a thing as bogus believing, false faith, counterfeit conversion. And if that's where you are because there's no movement, then there's a reason for you to examine yourselves and take heart in case you fail the test. But the good news is, is we can shatter that myth today in a, mo in a moment. Because God can give you a pure heart in an instant. But He cannot quickly change who you are. But He can start by changing your heart if you believe Him there. And we can bust this myth in a moment. And we can look at a strategy to break this myth, which holds many of us captive to thinking it's all about gaining more stuff, more informational stuff about God, thinking that will somehow move us from here to hear, and it's inadequate. We can't go from A to C, from one to three. If you don't pass through two, if you don't pass through B, you don't get C. God wants us to recognize that certainly spiritual doctrine, Christian doctrine, it's very good. It's very important. We need it. We need to know who God is. We need to know what the Trinity is. We need to know what the power of God is, what redemption is, what, what, what God wants to do with us. We need to know those things. They're important, but those things don't make you more like Jesus. They just inform you about Jesus. So look at the next one. So the kind of faith, the kind of belief that has this deeper connection at a heart level, this kind of belief motivates us towards action and is the saving kind. I, I love, I love for 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Look at this passage. This passage has this beautiful kind of mixture of action and believing. He says, for Christ's love does what? Compels us. You ever been compelled to do something? You know, it's like you just couldn't, you, you could not do it. You just were compelled to do it. It's not like someone was pushing you. I was compelled to do that. Some of you are compelled to do all kinds of things, and it's, it's not always good. It's not always good, right? Discernment begins to recognize what's my fleshly compulsions, and what is my new spiritual compulsions. For Christ's love compels us, because we are, here comes the believing part, we are convinced. We're convinced. That's what believing does. Believing convinced. I'm convinced that one died for all. Therefore all died. And he died for all of those who live. Those who've accepted. Those who have believed the heart kind. That those who live should no longer. Now look at this. Underline it. No longer live for themselves. But live for him who died for them. And was raised again. Now that's substantive faith. That's faith that refuses to stay where it's at and moves toward where God wants it to be. Do you have that kind of faith? What have you been compelled recently to do because of your love for Jesus? We can just like stop right now, huh? Huddle up in a little cluster and talk about what we've been doing because Christ's love has given us this compulsion that we could not say no to. We um, are trying to uh, create a, another layer of training um, in our church family. Um, so I've been telling our staff, every day is training day. Every interaction is training. It's kind of this idea that we want to be a loving community of growing disciples who are mentoring the next generation to live the mission of Jesus through the power of the gospel. If that stuff's all true, which I believe it is, I don't know, anybody else believe it's true? You, a lot of you said it, right? You said it. So we're trying to do this new layer of training to say, what does it look like for you to live it? To know I'm living out being 
an amazing lover. You ever think of yourself as an amazing lover? What did you give yourself? You know, give yourself A in loving. That'd be a great thing to be an A student in, huh? You're an A lover. Are you a B lover? C lover? D lover? <laughs> Would you get a failing grade in loving if the people around you scored you? That would be bad. <laughs> Wouldn't you want to be an A lover? <laughs> How about a disciple? What, would you want to be a disciplined disciple or would you want to be a lazy disciple? <laughs> so here's the deal. You know, whenever we, um, when, if, you, if you have a faith that has no compulsion to love like Jesus, then it may be a false faith. But if you know that you've got a love for God and you want to be better, then, then, then don't take any guilt home today. Don't, don't kind of walk out the door going, oh, no, I don't know if I'm really a believer. No, if you've got a love for God and you want to be like him, but you know you struggle and you don't really do very well, well, that doesn't mean you have a false faith. You just have a faltering faith. You just have a, a, a fragile faith. I mean, if you, if, you, if you are the kind of person that has no conviction about the things you do that you know are absolutely rooted in self-centeredness, if you've got no conviction about that, you might be a bogus believer. But if you've got this sense that, you know, there's a sense inside you that's like, oh, I did that again. And you've got this conviction inside you. Well, then you're not a bogus believer. You're just a baby believer, probably. You're just a baby believer. But you don't have to stay as a baby believer. You don't have to stay, you know, with a faltering faith. You can move out to a courageous faith, a bold faith. And so we've been kind of just recognizing in all these areas. And so we've been asking at this other level of training, having conversations to say, what would it look like for you to be more intentional in your loving, to be more disciplined in your discipleship, to be more involved in others in a mentoring context, and to be more bold to share your faith with people that are far from God? What would that look like in your world? Because that's God's agenda. That's about spiritual virtue, not doctrine. Knowing it, saying it, remembering it can be in the doctrine category. But that's about virtue, about who you really are. And God wants us to move in that direction. So how do we get there? Well, Christian doctrine is great. We want, to, we want that. That's a good part. It's a good piece of the puzzle, but it's just not the whole deal. Then the next one is that Christian practices. And Christian practices aren't about what we believe. It's about what we do. Okay, this, is this blank in your notes, I think? Should be. Did you already get it? <laughs> I'm just behind. Uh, it's, about, it's about what you do. And this, about what you do, empowers us to sustain a growing, vibrant relationship with Jesus. The Bible calls this training. Jesus said, in uh, Luke chapter, is it 640? In 640 he says, um, the student, everyone who is fully trained will be like his, his teacher. Everyone who's fully trained will be like his teacher. So was Jesus just kind of saying, yeah, it's, this is impossible to do. You'll never be like me. It's impossible. Just, just settle for, you know, being a messed up believer. Just settle for, you know, being in by the skin of your teeth. Or is he saying, no, I want you to be this radical follower of Jesus that literally begins to live more and more and more like Jesus and everybody in your sphere of influence is affected. What do you think he's saying? I believe he's saying this can happen. This can happen. Maybe you've never thought it can happen. It can happen, but it can happen by just requiring more informational stuff. It only happens as you begin to practice what pastor preaches. <laughs> it only begins to happen. See, the, the real genuine faith isn't just about talking it, it's about walking it. It's just not about lip service, it's about life service. It's about making it have traction in my life. And that happens when we begin to practice those things. Um, so another, another translation of one of our theme verses, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse, verse uh, 7, in the living translation. Now, this is a beautiful one. Spend your time and energy what does it say? Circle the word training yourself for spiritual fitness. Physical, okay, physical exercise has some value, but spiritual exercise is much more important for it promises a reward both in this, this life and in the, the next. Okay, so he does, he does this, this parallel illustration, right? So he, he, he illustrates spiritual fitness with what? 
Physical fitness. We know all about that, right? Our culture is obsessed with physical fitness, right? People are just crazy about getting in, in shape, but not all of us are that crazy. <laughs> you know, I can know all there is about physical fitness. I can know what exercises to do. I can know the address of the gym. <laughs> I can know what a good, healthy diet looks like. I can tell you what you should do. But if I don't do it, I'm still out of shape, right? I'm still not taking care of my physical being and maximizing my physical potential. The same is true spiritually. You can know everything there is to know about spiritual stuff. You can tell people what they ought to do. <laughs> but if you aren't doing it, if you're not employing it, you're not practicing it, then you'll never become C. Number three. You'll never get there. And so, yes, all, all we're doing, right? Why is every, every environment a training environment? Because we've got to get in shape. We've got to be in better condition spiritually. And so we're learning all kinds of things just at every level. So boy, I mean, for you, we just want to invite you into that culture. We want to invite you into that thing where you take that step. You know, you think about it. Did Michael Phelps want to just know about swimming? Did Simone Biles want to just know about gymnastics? Did she just want to say, I just want to watch gymnastics? Or did she say, I want to become a gymnast? I want to become... I, I want to become the best swimmer I can be, the best runner I can be, the best believer I can be. There's a reason the Bible says run with perseverance, the race marked out for you. Why? Because spiritual practices are about training. Where are you getting your spiritual training? This is good, but this, if, it's not, if this is not being employed on Monday, then this is inadequate. If this is not being employed on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, if you're not retaining it, it's inadequate. So where are you getting increased training and so for us, it's in every small group, it's in every ministry team, those where training happens at every single level, and we just want to invite you to be part of the team and to grow to your potential. The beautiful thing is, is when that happens, C happens, Christian virtue. So Christian virtue is the, the last of those things, and it's the direction, it's the goal of where we're going. I, I get more information so I can employ more practices, so I can understand those. That's just part of my rhythm. Every day, my rhythm is to spend time with Jesus. Every week, it's my rhythm to spend time, time with other men that are passionate about God. It's just the rhythm of my days and my weeks, which create more and more, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, fruit. So there's three things that create the virtue, that describe the virtue in the Bible. One is fruit, Galatians says, uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and la 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 la. <laughs> They're all good with that last one. <laughs> That's not a dirty word. It's not a dirty word to be self-controlled. It's a manifestation of God's presence in you. Embrace it. Say, Jesus, I want to be it and pursue it. And it will happen. It will happen. It happens one step at a time, one move at a time, when you're compelled by the Spirit to no longer live for Him, live for yourselves, but to live for Him who died for you and was raised again. Is Jesus' love compelling you to practice so you can have virtue? The other way it's described is in maturity. So uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 um, says, That old way of life has to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it and take on an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct. Look at this. As God accurately reproduces His what? Circle it. Is it in your notes? His character in you. You see, the, you see the manifestation, the virtue? Information doesn't cut it. Are you practicing it? Are you employing it? We've been saying to people, when they go through our small group leaders training, we're saying the goal is not for your people to do the homework. They're going, really? I thought the goal was the homework. No, 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 no. The goal is not that they do the homework. Only 
You see, someone can, someone can, if I don't know about you, but this is the way I always did homework at school. I would just, I would just have fun all week long, and then the night before the homework was due, I would, I would try to do the homework. Anybody else like me? Gosh, look at it. There's a bunch of us that are like that. When you cram for the test the night before the test, you ain't learned a thing. You haven't. When you cram before the night before you're supposed to have the homework done, you've not really, you've just force-fed yourself something that you've regurgitated in a moment, but you've forgotten as fast as it came in. It's the, the goal is not the homework. The goal is to leverage the homework into a daily activity that helps you begin to accept God's truth on a day-by-day moment-by-moment basis, so God does this transforming work inside of you, reproducing His character in you. That's the goal. Make sense? Make sense? But I like to cram. I know you do. I know you do. You cute little baby believer. (laughs) And then the last one is is Hebrews. Hebrews chapter uh, 12, about verse 11 um, he says, great little, it's, this one's not in your notes, is it? <laughs> okay. It's here somewhere. Hebrew says, but God is doing what is best for us, training us to live God's holy best. At the time, discipline isn't much fun. There's that dirty word again. It always feels like it's going against the grain. Later, of course, it pays off handsomely for it's the well, is it there yet? You just got to have to trust me. <laughs> it's the well trained who find themselves mature in their relationship with God. How many would like to do better training? Awesome. Awesome. How many just want to go home? <laughs> 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 Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to recognize that we are a people that, um, Lord, have a compulsion to do less when we should do more, to disengage when we should be engaged, to pull away when we should press in. And God, we recognize that that's a part of our flesh. It's a part of that stuff that we've been admonished in Scripture to put off so we can put on something new. What we want to put on is, is the kind of practices that help us to reflect you more and more, that increase our ability to recognize and discern when we have those fleshly responses, when we are defensive to someone's criticism, when we are angered by someone's behavior and we lash out, when we reminisce and ruminate about little things that others did to offend us. Lord, that those little things have intricately worked themselves into the very fabric of our thought life. And they do not reflect you, they reflect us. That part that you want us to deny and crucify so we can be more like you. We don't get there by trying. We get there by training. So God, in this moment, before we allow the speed of life to be re-engaged, we ask that you still our hearts and help us believe there, receive there, and commit there. That we might be people that do not make decisions from an emotional center, but from a Christ center. If you would receive that, just whisper, Jesus, I receive that. I receive that. That is my desire. God, help me take my next best step in the direction of training myself to live for you. God, we're going to need your help as we step out in faith to maybe do what we have not done, attend where we have not attended, Participate where we have not engaged. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be people who do not sit back, but step up. Put action in our faith. And we ask all this in your son's precious and mighty name. Amen. Amen.
Before you leave, turn and find someone that you think you could talk to and just ask the question, what will you take away with you today because you were here? What will you take away? God bless you. Have a great week. Look forward to seeing you next week. We start a new series soon called Unwrapping Your Spiritual Gifts, so stay tuned. Coming right up. God bless.